Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Director of Communications here at the Centre for International Governance Innovation, or CG. And I ask you, what do subprime mortgages, SUVs, and globalization all have in common? You could learn tonight. Uh, tonight's signature lecture speaker, award-winning economist Jeff Rubin, a trusted voice on the future of oil and energy and how they relate to the economic outlook, will give us his insight on oil and the end of globalization. Jeff Rubin was the chief economist at CIBC World Markets for almost 20 years. He was one of the first economists to accurately predict soaring oil prices in 2000 and is now one of the world's most sought after energy experts. Jeff Rubin has been the top ranked economist in Canadian financial markets for more than a decade. Rubin recently stepped down as chief economist at CIBC World Markets to devote his time exclusively to speaking and writing on economic issues. He's the author of the path-breaking book, Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller, as well as the Globe and Mail column, Ahead of the Curve. Rubin is a fixture in the media where he comments on federal budgets and other key economic events with a candor and a level of insight rarely matched by economic experts. He has appeared regularly on ABC, CBS, CNN, and CNBC, and his opinions and insights have been published on the front page of the New York Times, as well as the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, Financial Times, Business Week, Newsweek, and The Economist. Just think how much you're saving in subscription fees by coming here tonight. Please welcome to the podium, Mr. Jeff Rubin. Thank you, thank you. You know, knowing the nature of a disease is usually an essential first step to finding a cure. And so too is it with recessions. Knowing what caused the last recession should help us go a long way to avoid falling into another one. And that's never been more important as it is today because the recession that the global economy is still climbing out of is the deepest and longest one in the entire post-war period. Conventional wisdom espoused by your central bankers, your finance ministers, the pundits that you watch on television or read in the media, would have you believe that the recent recession was really a financial crisis whose roots lie in the now bankrupt U.S. subprime mortgage market. In other words, a whole bunch of unsellable, boarded up, repossessed homes in depressed property markets like Cleveland, all financed with easy credit subprime mortgages, hit financial markets like some kind of super toxic hydrogen bomb. And all of a sudden, a real estate market crash in the United States morphed into a devastating global recession. Gee, I never knew that Cleveland was that big. Well, no one has to tell me how important and how devastating the subprime mortgage market was on financial institutions. Why the hell do you think I'm an author now? But there's a big difference between blowing up investment banks and blowing up the global economy. I guess the problem that I have with the Cleveland hypothesis is why was it that countries that didn't have a subprime mortgage market, why did they have even deeper recessions than the U.S.? And why did some of those economies go into recession even before the U.S. economy keeled over? Maybe just maybe there was something else going on, something more important to the performance of the global economy than Cleveland property prices or the subprime mortgage market or indeed even investment banks. Maybe something like $147 a barrel oil prices, for example. If we know one thing about the, watching the global economy over the last 40 years, we know this. Feed it cheap oil, and it runs like a charm. All of a sudden, throw it expensive oil, and it seizes up almost overnight. Every major recession since the OPEC oil shocks over the last 40 years have had oil's fingerprints 
all over it. The first OPEC oil shock in 1973 led to what was at the time the deepest, most devastating post-war recession. The second OPEC oil shock led to two recessions, 1979 and 1982, the now infamous double dip that we fear today. Then in 1991, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and left half of its oil fields on fire, an oil spike to the then unheard of price of $40 a barrel, lo and behold, once again, the global economy went into a recession. Gee, I wonder what oil prices were doing before this recession. Seems to me that they rose from about $30 a barrel in early 2004 all the way up to almost $150 per barrel. Even in inflation adjusted or real terms, that was over double the price shock of either of the two OPEC oil shocks. And if both of those OPEC oil shocks were significant enough to cause, in their own right, devastating recessions, why wouldn't an oil shock over twice as big be the obvious culprit for what has been the deepest post-war recession? How do oil shocks create recessions? Well, they can create recessions in many ways, but the most fundamental linkage between oil shocks and recessions is that oil shocks always cause huge spikes in inflation. And those huge spikes in inflation are accompanied by huge spikes in interest rates that eventually snuff off growth. You know, there's no shortage of blame when it comes to the subprime mortgage fiasco. You could blame the rating agencies who gave subprime mortgage debt a triple A rating and said that it had the same chances of default as a U.S. Treasury bond or a Government of Canada bond. You could blame unscrupulous mortgage lenders who approved people who had no business to be approved for mortgages and then quickly flipped them to other financial institutions. You can blame the banks for playing Russian roulette in the derivatives market with depositors' money. And you can blame asleep at the wheel regulators, like the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States, for being either blind or indifferent to Wall Street's systemic risks to the subprime mortgage market. But most of all, what you can blame is the zero cost of money. All the greed in the world could not do what the Fed's free money policy made possible. You see, it was interest rates that created the subprime mortgage bubble, and it was interest rates that pricked the subprime mortgage bubble. You may recall at the time when unemployed people were getting subprime mortgages to go buy houses in Cleveland or Phoenix or in South Florida, you were probably getting credit cards in the mail that you hadn't even applied for that were giving you double the spending balance if you would just move your deposit from one bank to another. That's what happens when money is free. The Fed funds rate, the benchmark interest rate in the United States, was 1%. Unfortunately, however, it didn't stay free. Just as a record amount of subprime mortgage issuance was about to be financed in the U.S. capital markets, all of a sudden, inflation went from 1% to 5.5%. That was the highest that U.S. inflation had been since, coincidentally, 1991, when we had our last oil shock. And it didn't take long for the Fed funds rate to also move up to 5.5%, because every central banker, even misled central bankers like Alan Greenspan, will tell you that your borrowing rate is a mirror image of your inflation rate. What drove that huge increase in interest rates? Well, what drove that huge increase in interest rates was the same thing as what drove that huge increase in inflation. Why did inflation move from 1% in 2004 to almost 6% by the end of 2006? Almost all of that increase came from one component of the consumer price index the energy component. By the end of 2006, 
Energy inflation was running at 35 percent inside the U.S. Consumer Price Index. And the reason it was running at 35 percent was because of one price. The price of oil, which was $30 a barrel in 2004, and which at the time virtually every oil analyst under the sun was saying it would stay at $30, didn't stay at $30. It moved to over $75. If oil would have stayed at $30 a barrel, all those good people in Cleveland would still be in their homes, financed by free money subprime mortgages and venerable institutions on Wall Street like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers would probably still be operating. And I would probably still be the chief economist of CIBC. But that's not what happened. Instead, oil went from $30 to over $70 creating the same kind of interest rate shock it did in 1973, that it did in 1979, and that it did in 1991. And that's why we had the deepest post-war recession. Subprime mortgages was a symptom, not the cause. The cause was the reduction, the elimination of free credit, and that was an oil-driven spike in inflation. Now, you may ask yourself, how did oil prices ever get up to $147 a barrel? All the economists and all the energy analysts told you that that was impossible. It was impossible for two reasons. First of all, because higher oil prices would bring about new supply, and that new supply would push oil prices down, and because higher oil prices would rein in world demand, also pushing oil prices down. Well, the economists would point to what happened after the OPEC oil shocks. And when oil prices spiked, new forms of supply were found in Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, which is still America's largest producing field, in the North Sea. And when that new oil flowed, not only did it break OPEC's stranglehold over the market, but prices did come crashing down. This time, however, there are no more Prudhoe Bays there are no more North Seas. Higher oil prices did pull new supply, but not cheap supply. You know, the Canadian tar sands is not a new discovery. Back in 1920, there was a pilot plant in Fort McMurray that produced synthetic oil from bitumen. What's new is the notion that the tar sands could ever be considered a viable source of supply. At $20 a barrel, you couldn't give the stuff away, not here or even in Venezuela. At $80 a barrel, all of a sudden, it's one and a half million barrels a day. At $150 million, it's going to be three to four million barrels a day. Yes, we found new forms of supply, deep water oil and tar sands. Unfortunately, those forms of supply don't run at the oil prices that we'd like to burn. And I guess the second reason that economists told you that you could never see $147 a barrel oil is because at that price, oil demand would collapse. Well, I don't know about collapse, but oil demand sure fell in Canada, the United States, Japan, Western Europe, when oil reached over $70 a barrel. And turn the clock back 15, 20 years ago, if oil demand fell in those countries, global oil demand would be falling because 15 years ago, those countries accounted for about three quarters of all world oil production. Today, those countries barely account for half of the oil consumed. Where do you think the demand for oil has been growing the greatest? Many of you will probably think China, and it certainly has grown very significantly. But I know a place where it's been growing even faster than China, and it's the very place that you've been told is going to furnish you with your future supply. Last year, OPEC, along with two non-cartel producers, Russia and Mexico, consumed 13 and a half million barrels a day. That's almost two Chinas. What makes OPEC countries so thirsty for their own product? Well, if you've ever filled your tank up in Caracas, you'll get some sense of it. It's 20 cents a gallon. 
And if you go to Riyadh, it's a little bit more. It's about 40 cents a gallon. But it's 40 cents a gallon whether oil is $20 a barrel or oil is $147 a barrel. And if you think that, that car drivers get a good deal in OPEC, I know people who get way better deals, power users. How do you think they produce power in the Middle East? They don't have coal. They don't have hydro. We don't want them to have nuclear. So guess what they do? They burn the oil that you think they're going to be exporting to you, but not at 40 cents a gallon, at 7 cents a gallon. That's what every oil-fired utility is paying in Saudi Arabia as it powers 80% of the world's desalination plants. The point is not how much excess capacity OPEC has. OPEC has been exporting every year less and less because every year more and more of it is consumed at home. Now, there's very little that we can do about that, and if OPEC wants to cannibalize its own exports, its own oil. But in the future, future oil supply, chances are it's not coming from OPEC, and chances are it's not going to be cheap. Of course, there's the China and India's. China, 2 million barrels in 1980, now consuming about 8.5 million barrels. If you want to know where oil demand is growing outside of OPEC, just look at car sales. 70% of all the oil consumed in the world is consumed as a diesel fuel. It's not an accident that last year China surpassed the U.S. in vehicle sales, a market of 13 million versus 11, because last year was the first year in which there were actually fewer drivers on the road in the United States than any year before in the post-war period. Four million vehicles were decommissioned. They're not unrelated events. In a world where oil supply is no longer growing, driving becomes a zero-sum game, which means that if 13 million people are going to drive, become new drivers in China and India next year, somewhere 13 million people are going to have to get off the road, and that somewhere happens to be just here. So we can see that both in terms of demand and supply, the old benchmarks no longer work. Higher oil prices were not raising new sources of cheap supply, just new sources of ever more costly supply. And while our oil consumption has peaked and probably is facing decline, our oil consumption, just like our coal consumption, is now being eclipsed by rapidly developing countries. You know, the world will never run out of oil. There's 170 billion barrels of it in the Canadian tar sands. There's 500 billion barrels in the Orinoco tar sands in Venezuela. But what the world has run out of is the oil that we can afford to burn. Because the very oil prices that will turn the tar sands into tomorrow's Saudi Arabia, the very oil prices that within five years will see Canada producing more oil than Iran, is going to translate into pump prices that will take millions off the road. And not just millions off the road. While filling up at the gas tank is the most obvious way that we consume oil, we consume oil far more universally than just in our cars. Go into any big box store and see how much of the goods for sale in that store are made remotely close to where you live? And the answer will be none. And it won't matter whether that big box store is in, Woods, in Kitchener, Ontario, or Cincinnati, Ohio, because the answer will be the same. Oil is the DNA of our economy because it's oil that allows us to access the cheap labor markets halfway around the world that make all the things that we consume. The whole model of a global economy where we produce something at one end of the world for sale on the other end of the world, it's ostensibly about wage arbitrage, about finding the cheapest labor force, but it implies one thing, that transport costs are minimal. Well, that's true when oil's $20 a barrel. That's not true 
when oil is $150 a barrel. And no matter how you move goods or inputs around the world, whether you move them by air, whether you move them by boat, whether you move them by freight, whether you move them by truck, you're burning one fuel and one fuel only. And that fuel is oil as a transit fuel. In a world of triple-digit oil prices, all of those economics no longer makes any sense because accessing the cheap labor markets on the other side of the world for our food to our steel quickly becomes penny wise and pound foolish. By that I mean what producers save on wage costs they more than squander on bunker fuel. You know some very curious things were happening in the US steel market well, I would say just before the recession began. And what we noticed was that all of a sudden, U.S. steel production was up about 15%. And all of a sudden, China's steel imports or exports to the U.S. were down about 15, 20%. Well, what was happening? I'll tell you what was happening for the first time in about 20 years it was suddenly cheaper to make steel in the United States than import it from China. Why? Well, consider what China has to do to send us steel. First, they have to ship iron ore from Brazil across the Pacific Ocean, turn it into steel, which is in itself a very energy intensive process and then ship it back across the Pacific Ocean where it's then loaded on rail and truck to whatever its final destination is, be that Toronto, Chicago, New York, Kansas City or whatever. Well, how much labor do you think there is in making a ton of steel anymore? There's about one and a half hours of labor. Sure, the steel worker in Ontario or in Pennsylvania or Ohio is getting a multiple of what the steel worker is in China, but all of a sudden when the Trans-Pacific bunker charge, which is the diesel fuel cost that powers ships across the Pacific, when that hit triple digit levels, all of a sudden that added on $90 to the cost of producing a ton of hot rolled steel. And as I say, for the first time in 20 years, it was cheaper to manufacture steel in the United States than to actually import it from China. Who would have thought that triple digit oil prices could breathe new life into our hollowed out rust belt? But in a world where distance costs money, that's exactly what's going to happen. That was steel. Well, last year, China exported six billion dollars worth of food to North America. Everything from apples to frozen chicken wings. What do you think refrigerates those frozen chicken wings, assuming that they are refrigerated? What powers that refrigeration unit? Well, the same thing that powers the boat, bunker fuel. Steel doesn't need to be refrigerated, food does. In a world of triple-digit oil prices, we won't be accessing our frozen chicken wings from China any more than we'll be accessing steel. Because what we'd find is that the cost of moving goods around the world soon becomes greater than the labor savings being offered. And what we'll find is that, of course, in a world of triple-digit oil prices, just as we'll have to become more self-sufficient in steel, will also have to become more self-sufficient in food. The only problem is that over the last 20 to 30 years, much of our prime agricultural land has been paved over and is now the far-flung suburbs. Take Ontario, for example. In 1980, Ontario produced about 40% of its own food. Today, Ontario produces barely over 20% of its own food. And Ontario is no different than New York State or Ohio or literally any other jurisdiction in North America. Well, I think what we're going to find is that the very same economic forces that gutted our manufacturing sector and that paved over our farmland 
when oil costs were incidental, those very same economic forces are going to bring back those manufacturing jobs and they're going to return some of those far-flung suburbs back to the agricultural use of only 30 to 40 years ago. Because in a world of triple-digit oil prices, in a world of $2 a liter gasoline, people won't be able to afford to commute back and forth 80 kilometers in their SUVs from work to home anymore. And what we're going to find is that growing urban density will be the counterpart to the counterpoint to the last 20, 30 years of suburban uh, sprawl. And that will all be energy driven. So we're talking here about a return to far more local or regional economies. Because at the end of the day, there is absolutely nothing that we can do to avert triple digit oil prices. And if you doubt that, just look at where we are today. I mean, even in the most anemic of recoveries, and by all past yardsticks, the global recovery is about as anemic as it gets, the first thing you notice about any recovery is economies start burning more oil. And the next thing you know, oil prices start to rise. Oil prices are already over double their recession lows. Oil today is trading at over $80 a barrel. And that's with virtually every major oil-consuming economy, including the largest of them all, the gas-guzzling 19 million barrel a day U.S. economy, still miles below its pre-recession level. In fact, in the G7, only Germany and Canada are back to where they were in 2008, and oil is trading at $80 a barrel. Well, turn the clock back only three years ago, and today's $80 a barrel price would have been a world all-time record high for oil. Now it's where oil trades when the economy is in the shadow of its deepest global recession. Where do you think oil prices will trade when the economies get back to where they were before the recession? Or indeed, try to grow beyond that? I think we'll find that very shortly, we will see those same triple digit oil prices. I don't mean in years, I mean in months. But it's far from, from obvious to me that the world economy is any better able to deal with those triple digit oil prices than it was in 2008. As I say, there's not a whole lot we can do about averting a return to triple digit oil prices, but there's much that we can do to make sure that when that happens, it doesn't have to have as devastating an impact on our lives and our economy as it's had in the past. And by that I mean that we are going to move from the template of a global economy back to a local and regional economy. Because a global economy is an extremely energy intensive way of doing business and it's in particular an extremely oily way of doing business. Because while we can substitute many things for oil in many applications, We've already substituted natural gas for oil as a home heating fuel. We've substituted natural gas for oil as a power generation fuel. We can substitute cheap natural gas for oil as a source to make plastics and other petrochemicals. We have not been able to substitute natural gas or anything else for oil as a transit fuel. And that, of course, is because Oil is a very efficient transit fuel. It packs about four times the energy density of natural gas and about 20 times the energy density of the lithium ion battery. I guess it would be important to talk a little bit about what triple digit oil prices may mean in the context of the Canadian economy. Because while Canada is going to be subject to all the general trends of deglobalization that I spent my first remarks discussing, Canada is also going to be a petrol power on a scale that it never has been in the past. In the past, in the world of conventional oil, Canada was always a tier two player. But 
conventional oil is not where the future oil supply lies. The future oil supply lies in non-conventional oil. And that all of a sudden catapults Canada from a B-League player to an A-League player. The U.S. Department of Energy and the International Energy Agency are in fact forecasting that production from the Canadian tar sands will go from one and a half million barrels a day where it is today to about four million barrels by 2020. And that will mean that Canada will be a larger oil producer and certainly a larger oil exporter than even Iran. There is obviously many positive stories to that because we are going to see Middle East type wealth generation being attracted to Canada's tar patch. But what we will find is that many things go with being an energy superpower, like for example having a super exchange rate. You may have noticed that just as oil prices defy all past norms, already trading at what was only three years ago record highs, so too does the Canadian dollar defy past norms. The Canadian dollar is trading within pennies of parity against the US. And while that has happened before, that has always happened at the peak of a cycle, not at the beginning of a cycle. Normally, at this stage of the cycle, the Canadian dollar should be trading at around 70 cents to the U.S., not at 97 to 98 cents. What's driving the Canadian dollar? Well, the Canadian dollar has de facto become a petrol currency. And the combination of tar sand production going from 1.5 million to 4 million the combination of Canadian oil exports going from 25% of U.S. imports to 33% of U.S. imports, and most of all, the combination of oil prices themselves going from $80 back up to $150, because without those prices, we wouldn't be able to raise three to four million barrels out of the tar sands. All of those things are going to take the Canadian dollar to places it's never been before. The Canadian dollar is going to be a premium currency against the greenback, and I don't mean a couple of pennies. I mean the Canadian dollar is going to trade at a double-digit premium to the U.S. dollar, somewhere in the neighborhood of a 10 to 20 percent advantage. And while that's certainly not going to hurt anybody in Alberta, because the simple fact of the matter is that Alberta tar sands is really the only source of future supply growth that U.S. consumers can be able to access in the next 10 years. I'm not so sure what it will mean for the rest of the country. To be sure, a super exchange rate will bring back some long-lost NHL franchises. And perhaps speaking here at the Basili Institute, it may even bring back the Hamilton Tigers. In 1925, the team that finished first in the National Hockey League's regular league season was the Hamilton Tigers. The owners wouldn't pay the players during the playoffs, so they went on strike and never challenged for the Stanley Cup. That summer, they were sold to an American bootlegger who moved the team to New York to the newly opened Madison Square Gardens and they re-emerged in the 1926 season as the New York Americans, later to become the New York Rangers. Oil was $1.47 a barrel. When oil's $147 a barrel, it will do something that Jim Basile has not been able to do, bring the Tigers back to Hamilton, and probably bring the Jets back to Winnipeg and the Nordiques back to Quebec City. But that's about all it'll bring from the U.S. How long will Ontario be the single largest manufacturer of motor vehicles in North America when the Canadian dollar is a buck twenty against the U.S.? How long will American tourists go up to Lunenburg and Peggy's Cove and find when they get their visa bills that their Canadian vacations are costing 20% more than vacations in their own country. I think that what we'll find is that going forward,
The big schisms and divisions in this country are going to be energy-based. Will the morphing of the Canadian dollar into a petrol currency be Alberta's revenge for the national energy program? Back in 1981 and 1982, Alberta was raped to the tune of several billion dollars to subsidize central man manufacturing in central Canada by having made in Canada below world oil prices. Are the tables about to be turned? You find more and more of the fault lines being drawn against long energy. For example, the recent election in New Brunswick saw a government thrown out of power when it dared to sell its provincial utility to Quebec Hydro. Why do you think Newfoundland and Quebec don't talk to each other? Because Quebec won't give access uh, for Newfoundland power through the Quebec grid, which basically stymies the development of the Lower Churchill Falls. Why do you think Quebec and Ontario want to have a price on carbon? Because by having a price on carbon, they can limit the growth of tar sand production and limit the extent to which the Canadian dollar can morph into a petrol currency. I'm not suggesting that there's any higher moral ground. If the tar sands were in Chicoutimi, I expect that the province of Quebec would have the same carbon policy as the province of Alberta. And similarly, if the tar sands were in Sudbury, ditto for what has to this point been a very green Dalton McGuinty government. But I think we're going to find that the major divisions and the major schisms in, these, in this country are for the most part going to be energy-based. Now, that may well be a problem that many other economies would like to have. But certainly, redistributing the petrol wealth and immunizing parts of the economy that will be hurt by the implications for the currency are going to weigh heavily on the Canadian agenda. You know, to close up, the realm of triple-digit oil prices has traditionally been the realm of the apocalypse. That is, most people who talk about oil prices going to where I think they're going talk about it as the end of economies as we know it. Some even suggest the end of civilization as we know it. I don't share that pessimism. I don't share that pe pessimism because I'm an economist. And as an economist, I believe in the power of prices. Yes, if we insist on getting our frozen chicken wings from halfway around the world, let alone our steel from halfway around the world, and if we insist on commuting 80, 90 kilometers to work and back in our SUVs, pretty soon peak oil will be peak GDP. Pretty soon we'll find that we just go through a never-ending series of oil-based recessions. But I don't, as I say, believe that people will simply ignore price signals. Triple-digit oil prices will change the way we live and change the way that our economy operates. And we just might find that the smaller, more local, regional world lying around the corner is a lot more livable and a lot more sustainable than the big oily world we're about to leave behind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are, uh, there are a couple of microphones out on the side, so um, anybody who'd like to uh, ask questions, it be a good time to fire away. Yes. Uh, knowledge society, knowledge economy, doesn't cost too much to, uh, to ship knowledge. Uh, I said no knowledge economy knowledge society. It doesn't cost too much to ship knowledge. Uh, increasingly, we're moving in that direction. It's not sufficiently viable yet. Do you feel that your non-oily future will uh, be, uh, include a very robust knowledge economy and knowledge society? The question is about a knowledge-based economy. What role will that have? You know, it's, it's quite interesting what's happened in the last 20 years. Most of the time, uh, of my career as a chief economist of an investment bank, inflation was always the preserve of the service sector because the service sector 
you were insulated from global pressures. And it was the goods sector that nobody had any pricing power because you could always find a, way, a labor market somewhere on the other side of the world that would make it cheaper. But what we're finding is that one of the areas that's likely to survive is just the opposite. It's business services. It doesn't cost a lot of energy to transmit data around the world. It doesn't cost a lot to actually provide global services, certainly not in an energy way. What we're going to find is that the sectors that were the most protected, which were like the business service sector, is actually probably going to be one of the few areas that's going to survive the deglobalization. And it's the goods sector that's going to go back to being protected. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the nature of our jobs are going to be changing too because, you know, for the last 30 years, there's been this never-ending move to shrink the goods sector and work in the service sector. And we're either working on Bay Street or we're making cafe lattes and Starbucks, but, but no one's actually, like, producing things. I mean, how many people go in to become tool and die workers in the labor force. Not too many because how many jobs are there for tool and die workers? I think we're going to find that the nature of the labor force is going to change. That as we start making our own things, whether it's steel, whether it's growing our own food, or making our own flat screen TVs, that the entire requirements of the labor force are going to start to change. And in a curious way, the future may be in more than one sense, a throwback to the past, at least in terms of the skills that we're going to be now needing. Yeah. We're uh, part of a free market economy, and I'm just curious as to uh, what your attitude is towards potentially China buying up our oil companies in Canada. Is this an advantage or a disadvantage? Obviously, it's an advantage maybe to the uh, uh, shareholders, but uh, how do you feel about ownership uh, going to other countries? in our uh, natural resources. Okay. Um, I guess the question is, how do we feel about PetroChina or Sinopec scooping up Suncor, Syncrude, whatever? Um, let's be clear about one thing. We're not increasing tar sand production from one and a half million barrels to four million barrels so people in Red Deer can fill up. Okay, this isn't for the Canadian market. This is entirely for the export market. Now, one of the things that I think Nancy Pelosi and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Waxman have found out is they're not the only market. Enbridge wants to build a pipeline to Kitimat, a 900,000 barrel a day pipeline, because China will take all the oil that we have to offer. So the question becomes, uh, how do we feel about who owns it? Well. Let's be clear, we're doing this for export, and if I'm right, the principal export market in the future is going to be China, not the United States. Because if world oil production is more or less peaked, China can't double its oil consumption over the next 10 years without somebody having their oil consumption halved. And what's happening in motor vehicle sales suggests that 10 years from now, the U.S. will be consuming 9 to 10 million barrels a day, and 10 years from now, China will be consuming 19 million barrels a day. Now, what about the question of ownership, okay? I don't think it's particularly important who owns it, but what I do think is important is that the people of Alberta and the people of Canada get their fair share of the royalties. And unfortunately, in Alberta, they benchmark royalties to the United States. Bad benchmark. False benchmark. You see, the tar sands is a very special place, not just because of what's under the ground, but what's above the ground. Let's juxtapose the Alberta tar sands with their geological competitor, the Orinoco heavy oil belt, the Venezuelan tar sands. Well, three years ago, Exxon spent a couple billion dollars on a heavy oil upgrader in Rio Negro. All of a sudden, Hugo Chavez told them that their new partner was Petroleus de Venezuela. They reneged and they were expropriated. Three months later, the Curl Lake project, previously deemed too expensive to go ahead, 
got the green light from Exxon's subsidiary in Canada, Imperial Oil. What the folk in Alberta and Canada really don't recognize is how unique North America is, how out of whack our royalties are. I think as oil prices start moving up, we can expect resource nationalism to become more intense, not just in Venezuela, but in Canada. And I don't really care if the tar sands are owned by Exxon, or in their Canadian guise, Imperial Oil, or they're owned by Petrol China. But what I think is important is the Canadians, Albertans, get a bigger share of the resource rents. And I think that's exactly what many of the huge political issues in this country are going to be about in the next 10 years. Further questions? Yeah. I read in the Global Mail business section that uh, some economists predict a $60 barrel oil cost in 2011, 2012. I wonder where these guys come up with those ideas. It doesn't make any sense. Second question, do you think oil production is peaking at this time? Okay, I, I think oil prices can go lower than $60. I think they can go all the way to $40 if we have another oil-induced recession like we had in 2008. You know, when oil prices fell to $40 a barrel during the recession, a lot of people thought that it had no business ever being at $147 a barrel. But what those people didn't recognize is when oil fell to $40 a barrel in the 2008 recession, world oil demand actually fell for the first time since 1983. Such was the severity of the recession. Peak oil is not a problem if the, pa if the economy it's powering is going to shrink. It's only a problem if we want to grow the economy. The first thing we noted about an economic recovery, oil demand comes like a jack-in-the-box right back up. The next thing you know, we're at $80 a barrel. Now, when we get back up the triple-digit oil prices, we may well have another oil-induced re recession. And oil may fall again down to $40 a barrel. It's not because oil's cheap and abundant. It's just because we couldn't afford not being in a recession. As for are we at peak, you know, peak is unfortunately thought of in a geological terms. We'll never run out of oil in an absolute geological sense. There's, there's billions of gallons of barrels in the tar sands. There's billions more in oil shale. But that's not really the issue. It doesn't matter if there's 174 billion barrels of oil in the Athabasca tar sands, if the price of getting that out translates into triple digit oil prices, because the global economy won't run on triple digit oil prices. So what I think makes a lot more sense, a lot more meaningful, is depletion as an economic concept, not as some absolute geological concept. What we've run out of is the oil that we can afford to burn. There are no more sources of supply of cheap oil. You know, if we want to convert two tons of sand, burn over a thousand cubic feet of natural gas, and pollute 250 gallons of fresh water to make one barrel of synthetic oil out of the tar sands, yeah, there's an inexhaustible supply, but as I say, to get the kind of production that people are expecting out of the tar sands is going to be a return to triple-digit oil prices. And if you doubt that, just look at what happened in Fort McMurray in 2008 when oil fell to $40 a barrel. You might have liked the prices at the pumps, but Suncor and Syncrude and Imperial Oil didn't. There was $50 billion of capital spending cut when oil prices fell to $40 a barrel. Next question. Thank you for that presentation, very interesting. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to speculate a little bit. Uh, I have the privilege of, uh, of having lived in, and continued to work with communities in the, the Canadian High North, uh, Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and uh, I was uh, wondering if you could just, you know, uh, provide us with your thoughts on uh, the situation that remote communities, not only in the Arctic, but in places that don't have the option of plugging into a natural gas grid or uh, options for transportation are going to find themselves in and uh, what this means for Canadian policy. Well, I think, uh, you know, those, those communities have found ways to be a lot more sustainable than perhaps we have and that perhaps we'll be needing to take 
a page out of some of those isolated communities. Not in the sense that, you know, we're going to become prisoners of economic isolation, but I think, you know, I mean, the central message, if there is a central message from what I'm talking about, is the growing economic imperative of self-sufficiency as we get back to more of a local or regional model of economy, so many of the things that we now take for granted are not going to be tenable in the future. And it's going to be precisely our ability to become more self-sufficient that is going to immunize us from triple digit oil prices, or at least mitigate some of the economic impacts. Talking about the far north, I mean, one thing that we'll see is as oil prices go higher and higher, we search for oil in more and more remote and secluded places. There was, of course, the debate over the Arctic Wilderness uh, Reserve in Alaska. There is, right now, a moratorium until 2014 on Arctic drilling. We'll see if that moratorium lasts, if triple-digit oil prices come back as quickly as I think. You know, not to put too fine a point on it, but we often take a, a holier-than-thou attitude compared to what goes on in the United States when the Macondo well ruptured in that ecological disaster in the Gulf of Mexico when the Deepwater Horizon rig exploded. Chevron was drilling a well twice as deep as the Macondo well about 400 kilometers northeast of St. John's, Newfoundland. So, I mean, deep water is in our backyard, too. I think, you know, we find some parallels here, whether we're talking about deep water, whether we're talking about tar sands, whether we're talking about shale gas, which is that all forms of non-conventional energy, not only do they require a lot of energy to access the energy, but they're extremely problematic and harsh on the environment. You know, in the world of oil exploration, you typically don't leave the easiest for the last. Further questions? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very stimulating thesis. My question's about electric vehicles. So you're suggesting oil is uh, largely hasn't been replaced for transportation. Uh, even the Globe and Mail today has a significant uh, story about uh, electric vehicles and we have, what, 30 different models on the very near horizon coming on board. That electricity is not going to come from oil. That electricity no. is going to come from nuclear, natural gas, hydro, and almost certainly more coal. But um, isn't that your price signal starting to act right now, perhaps? Well, it's interesting you say that. Um most people may not recognize that prior to the discovery by Cadillac of the electric starter, there were more electric vehicles than there were internal combustion driven engines. Of course, you needed the physique of a weightlifter to start your internal combustion engine when it required a crankshaft. And then, of course, the, electric co the, the internal combustion engine totally, totally eclipsed the electric car. But realize one thing about the electric car. I mean, a battery is not a form of energy, and the lithium-ion battery is about, has 1 20th the energy density of oil. So where are we going to get the spare capacity to plug in 250 million electric cars? I remember about seven or eight years ago, I walked down about 30 flights of stairs in my office building because one air conditioner too many was plugged on and the whole grid collapsed between Ohio, uh, Upper New York State, and, and Southern Ontario. I think Toronto was out power for like 24 hours. Now plug in 250 million vehicles and see what happens. Where, how could we increase our power capacity by that order of magnitude to power even 50 million vehicles? Well, not without emulating our climate change partners like China and India and building 800 coal plants. But I think that we would find that whatever emission savings we get from the tailpipe are more than dwarfed by what comes out the smokestack. Economic history teaches us that necessity is the mother of invention. And indeed, if we have to encounter triple-digit oil prices for the next 10 or 15 years, that will lead us to the discovery of alternative fuels for transit. 
whether it is hydrogen, whether it is electrification, whether it is natural gas. Unfortunately, our rendezvous with triple-digit oil prices is not in 10 to 15 years. Our rendezvous with triple-digit oil prices could well be within 10 to 15 weeks. So, instead of trying to figure out how to turn cow shit into high-octane fuel, we're just going to have to learn to get off the road. In other words, the adjustment has to be on the demand side. And indeed, that's what happened. Last year, there was 4 million less vehicles on the road in the United States than there was the year before. Now, that's vehicles. But as I say, we consume oil not just in our tanks. We consume oil every time we go into a big box store and buy something made halfway around the world. We think we're consuming just their cheap labor, but it's oil that brings their cheap labor to us. You know, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to do that. So the adjustment on the demand side is we're going to have to start growing our own food. We're going to have to start making our own steel because the luxury of time frames is that we have to make this adjustment now because triple digit oil prices is on tomorrow's doorstep. So I'm not poo-pooing or in any way trying to trivialize the importance of coming up with, with new sources of supply as a transit fuel. I'm just saying that in the here and now, the adjustment has to be on the demand side and what makes economic sense? What is a rational economic response to triple digit oil prices when we don't have a substitute for oil as a transit fuel is to make our economies a whole lot less oily. And that means going from a global to a more regional or local template. Further questions? First of all, with respect to uh, PetroChina, uh, the problem with a firm like that, that's controlled by a powerful country like China, uh, persuading them to be a good corporate citizen and, and make the adjustments so they don't demand as much uh, uh, water or natural gas and so on may, may, may be problematic. Uh, with respect to uh, sustainability, I take it even down to the home level. I think increasingly, particularly as solar cells become uh, more, more cost uh, efficient and so on, we will have our own solar cells. And with these, we can produce uh, both electricity, and I, I wouldn't use a lithium-ion battery. <clears throat> I'd use what it's called a, uh, uh, an ultra battery. It's a hybrid between an ultra capacitor and a battery, uh, part lead battery and so on, developed in Australia, manufactured in Japan. You can go much further much, on a much cheaper battery. So this is going to make certain things uh, possible. And also in the home, conceivably in the future, we could use electricity to produce hydrogen. So when we're going to go on a longer trip, we'd maybe put hydrogen in it, and then there'd be hydrogen stations along the highway and so on. So there's all these possibilities that are out there that technology uh, make possible. Well, uh, and I, I'm sure there are, but I guess uh, my response to that would be, um, about three weeks ago, I, I was making a speech in Copenhagen. And, um, you know, the first thing you notice when you land in Copenhagen, the island is surrounded by windmills. And Denmark has a world leading 20% of its power is generated by wind power. And Denmark is a country, unlike Canada, that has reduced its emissions. They're now about 6% below the 1990 level, which was the reference here for the Kyoto Accord. Ours is about 25, 30% higher. So I just asked, so 20% is wind power. What's the other 80%? It's coal power. I said, coal? Uh, just to give you some benchmarks, we're about 13% coal. The US is about 50% coal. China's about 80% coal. And I'm saying, well, you know, you have the same percentage of power supplied by coal as China, but then how have you reduced your emissions to 6% below 1990 levels? And the answer to that lies not in the source of power, but in the price of power. Because whether you get that power from a wind turbine or from a coal generating plant, you pay 30 cents per kilowatt hour. We in Ontario pay about seven to eight cents per kilowatt hour. Well, guess what? People in Copenhagen use a fraction of the power that people use in Toronto. But I bet you 
that you could lower emissions in coal places like Alberta, Wyoming, Kentucky, West Virginia, without us putting up one wind turbine. You just got to charge them 30 cents per kilowatt hour and people will start using a whole lot less energy. I'll give you another example about Copenhagen. Everybody there is riding a bike. So at first I thought that was a commitment to environmental consciousness or at least physical fitness because everybody looks like they're totally in shape. Then I asked innocently, uh, what does it cost to buy a car here? Well, depending on how many horses are under the hood, you pay a surtax equal to from 100 to 180 percent of the sticker price of a car. In other words, for what you could pay for three cars in Waterloo is one car in Copenhagen. I too would be riding a bike. The point is not to denigrate the Danes for the, their use of wind power, that's great, but to understand what's doing the heavy lifting here, what's doing the heavy lifting here is they make energy very expensive. And guess what? People find a way of using less. And you don't see millions of people emigrating from Copenhagen. And people in Copenhagen seem to very much enjoy their quality of life. I'm, I'm suggesting perhaps we too could take a page out of that model. And in fact, that's exactly what Ontario has done. Because when we said no to the nuclear power plants, and said we're going to allow wind and solar to access our grid at 13 to 19 cents a kilowatt hour, what we're really saying is we're going to make energy more expensive and we're not going to consume as much energy, so we're not going to need to build any coal plants and any nuclear power plants. And I don't see any problem with that. Next question. I just had a question about how you think um, climate change will impact energy demands worldwide. Very interesting question. Very interesting question. Um, you know, many people think that because we're running out of affordable oil that the silver lining here is that somehow it's going to have a positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Let's understand where the bulk of greenhouse gas emissions come from. They come from coal. And we don't use coal as a transit fuel. We use coal basically as a source of power generation. In some places in the world, there are still little pockets, even in the Maritimes, in the U.S. Northeast, where they burn oil for power. In the Middle East, they certainly burn oil for power. But in most places, running out of oil isn't going to mean that we're all of a sudden switching to cleaner fuels, because really, when you look at the emission trail, the major emission trail is coming out of coal. And, you know, here's the problem with coal. We're closing the Nanticoke coal plant on Lake Erie, okay? And we're all going to pay higher electricity prices as a result of that. But in the next two years, India and China are building 800 coal plants. So what's the point of that? There's no borders up there in the biosphere. And this is what I say. I say you can't make our producers pay twice. You can't make them pay for their own emissions and then pay again as they lose market share to import some countries that don't pay for their emissions. Because all that does is send jobs away and it actually sends production to less green factories. What I say is we got to put a price on carbon emissions in our own economy and apply that price universally to all goods that want to be sold in this economy through a carbon tariff. And I think what we'll find is that instead of sending jobs away by raising the bar, we're going to bring jobs back home. One last question, because I've got to drive home tonight. So far tonight, we've talked about the price of oil and, and what it does to the economy. We've also, you've also expressed that we're not running out of oil, which I would agree with. Could you just uh, comment to the people on what happens when the EROI uh, of producing or getting that oil um, rises above one, uh, one to one ratio. He means the, qu the questioner is at the energy rate of return, which is how much energy you spend getting, getting the energy out of the ground. And the Canadian tar sands is a perfect example of that. You got to burn over a thousand cubic feet of natural gas to get one barrel of synthetic oil. Now, 
What makes that possible is that natural gas is at an all-time low price relative to oil. It's less than a third the price per BTU of energy. It hasn't always been the case. Remember when Hurricane Katrina hit? Well, Hurricane Katrina wiped out temporarily natural gas production in the Gulf of Mexico. All of a sudden, natural gas was more expensive than oil, which made the tar sands reverse alchemy. It was like turning gold into lead. Well, if natural gas prices would have stayed higher than oil, believe me, nobody would be investing billions of dollars in the tar sands. But whether we're talking about tar sands, whether we're talking about converting corn ethanol into a combustible fuel, whether we're talking about fracturing shale rock with hydraulic cocktails to access the shale gas, it's not the old days where you just stick a rig down and oil comes squirting out. You're spending a lot of energy to get the energy. And for NOAA, if there's any reason why oil prices are going in the direction that they're going, it's precisely because of that. Thank you very much. Well, Jeff uh, Rubin, on behalf of CG and everyone here, I'd like to thank you for speaking to us tonight about uh, how the rising cost of oil is radically changing the world. It's very stimulating and interesting discussion, and thank you for taking all those questions. Uh, Jeff's book is on sale here tonight for $22 or $23.10 with tax at the back of the room just over this way, and Jeff is happy to sign copies for people who'd like a book. It's a must-read, not just for people concerned about oil, but for anyone interested in understanding the direction of the uh, global economy. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors tonight, 570 News and Wordsworth Books, and I want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending CG's Signature Lecture Series. Our next lecture is on Wednesday, November 3rd, when Dr. Adam Chapnick will be speaking about the life of John Holmes, a prominent Canadian thinker on foreign policy, and there'll be tours of the John Holmes Library upstairs here. So come on out then, and uh, thank you again for coming tonight. Climbing out of is the deepest and longest one in the entire post-war period. Conventional wisdom espoused by your central bankers, your finance ministers, the pundits that you watch on television or read in the media, would have you believe that the recent recession was really a financial crisis whose roots lie in the now bankrupt U.S. subprime mortgage market. In other words, a whole bunch of unsellable, boarded up, repossessed homes in depressed property markets like Cleveland, all financed with easy credit subprime mortgages, hit financial markets like some kind of super toxic hydrogen bomb. And all of a sudden, a real estate market crash in the United States morphed into a devastating global recession. Gee, I never knew that Cleveland was that big. Well, no one has to tell me how important and how devastating the subprime mortgage market was on financial institutions. Why the hell do you think I'm an author now? But there is a big difference between blowing up investment banks and blowing up the global economy. I guess the problem that I have with the Cleveland hypothesis is why was it that countries that didn't have a subprime mortgage market, why did they have even deeper recessions than the U.S.? And why did some of those economies go into recession even before the U.S. economy keeled over? Maybe, just maybe, there was something else going on. Something more important to the performance of the global economy than Cleveland property prices or the subprime mortgage market, or indeed even investment banks. Maybe something like $147 a barrel oil prices, for example. If we know one thing about the, watching the global economy over the last 40 years, we know this. Feed it cheap oil and it runs like a charm. All of a sudden, throw it expensive oil and it seizes up almost overnight. 
every major recession since. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Director of Communications here at the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG. And I ask you, what do subprime mortgages, SUVs, and globalization all have in common? You could learn tonight. Uh, tonight's signature lecture speaker, award-winning economist Jeff Rubin, a trusted voice on the future of oil and energy and how they relate to the economic outlook, will give us his insight on oil and the end of globalization. Jeff Rubin was the chief economist at CIBC World Markets for almost 20 years. He was one of the first economists to accurately predict soaring oil prices in 2000 and is now one of the world's most sought after energy experts. Jeff Rubin has been the top ranked economist in Canadian financial markets for more than a decade. Rubin recently stepped down as chief economist at CIBC World Markets to devote his time exclusively to speaking and writing on economic issues. He's the author of the path-breaking book why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller, as well as the Globe and Mail column ahead of the curve. Ruben is a fixture in the media where he comments on federal budgets and other key economic events with a candor and a level of insight rarely matched by economic experts. He has appeared regularly on ABC, CBS, CNN, and CNBC, and his opinions and insights have been published on the front page of the New York Times, as well as the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, Financial Times, Business Week, Newsweek, and The Economist. Just think how much you're saving in subscription fees by coming here tonight. Please welcome to the podium, Mr. Jeff Rubin. Thank you, thank you. You know, knowing the nature of a disease is usually an essential first step to finding a cure. And so too is it with recessions. Knowing what caused the last recession should help us go a long way to avoid falling into another one. And that's never been more important as it is today because the recession that the global economy is still. The banks for playing Russian roulette in the derivatives market with depositors' money. And you can blame asleep at the wheel regulators like the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States for being either blind or indifferent to Wall Street's systemic risks to the subprime mortgage market. But most of all, what you can blame is the zero cost of money. All the greed in the world could not do what the Fed's free money policy made possible. You see, it was interest rates that created the subprime mortgage bubble, and it was interest rates that pricked the subprime mortgage bubble. You may recall at the time when unemployed people were getting subprime mortgages to go buy houses in Cleveland or Phoenix or in South Florida, you were probably getting credit cards in the mail that you hadn't even applied for that were giving you double the spending balance if you would just move your deposit from one bank to another. That's what happens when money is free. The Fed funds rate, the benchmark interest rate in the United States, was 1%. Unfortunately, however, it didn't stay free. Just as a record amount of subprime mortgage issuance was about to be financed in the U.S. capital markets, all of a sudden, inflation went from 1% to 5.5%. That was the highest that U.S. inflation had been since, coincidentally, 1991, when we had our last oil shock. And it didn't take long for the Fed funds rate to also move up to 5.5%, because every central banker, even misled central bankers like Alan Greenspan, will tell you that your borrowing rate is a mirror image of your inflation rate. What drove that huge increase in interest rates? Well, what drove that huge increase in interest rates was the same thing as what drove that huge increase in inflation. Why did inflation move from 1% in 2004 to almost 6% by the end of 2006? Almost all of that increase came from one component, 
of the Consumer Price Index, the energy component. By the end of 2006, energy inflation was running at 35 percent inside the U.S. Consumer Price Index. And the reason it was running at 35 percent was because of one price. The price of oil, which was $30 a barrel in 2004, and which at the time virtually every oil analyst under the sun was saying it would stay at $30, didn't stay at $30. It moved to over $75. If oil would have stayed at $30 a barrel, all those good people in Cleveland would still be in their homes, financed by free money subprime mortgages and venerable institutions on Wall Street like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers would probably still be operating. And I would probably still be the chief economist of CIBC. But that's not what happened. Instead, oil went from $30 to over $70, creating the same kind of interest rate shock it did in 1973, that it did in 1979, and that it did in 1991. And that's why we had the deepest post-war recession. Subprime mortgages was a symptom, not the cause. The cause was the reduction, the elimination of free credit, and that was an oil-driven spike in inflation. Now, you may ask yourself, how did oil prices ever get up to $147 a barrel? All the economists and all the energy analysts told you that that was impossible. It was impossible for two reasons. First of all, because higher oil prices would bring about new supply, and that new supply would push oil prices down, and because higher oil prices would rein in world demand, also pushing oil prices down. Well, the economists would point to what happened after the OPEC oil shocks, and when oil prices spiked, new forms of supply were found in Prudhoe Bay in Alaska which is still America's largest producing field, in the North Sea. And when that new oil flowed, not only did it break OPEC's stranglehold over the market, but prices did come crashing down. This time, however, there are no more Prudhoe Bays. There are no more North Seas. Higher oil prices did pull new supply, but not cheap supply. You know, the Canadian the OPEC oil shocks over the last 40 years have had oil's fingerprints all over it. The first OPEC oil shock in 1973 led to what was at the time the deepest, most devastating post-war recession. The second OPEC oil shock led to two recessions, 1979 and 1982, the now infamous double dip that we fear today. Then in 1991, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and left half of its oil fields on fire, an oil spike to the then unheard of price of $40 a barrel, lo and behold, once again, the global economy went into a recession. Gee, I wonder what oil prices were doing before this recession. Seems to me that they rose from about $30 a barrel in early 2004 all the way up to almost $150 per barrel. Even in inflation-adjusted or real terms, that was over double the price shock of either of the two OPEC oil shocks. And if both of those OPEC oil shocks were significant enough to cause, in their own right, devastating recessions, why wouldn't an oil shock over twice as big be the obvious culprit for what has been the deepest post-war recession. How do oil shocks create recessions? Well, they can create recessions in many ways, but the most fundamental linkage between oil shocks and recessions is that oil shocks always cause huge spikes in inflation. And those huge spikes in inflation are accompanied by huge spikes in interest rates that eventually snuff off growth. You know, there's no shortage of blame when it comes to the subprime mortgage fiasco. You could blame the rating agencies who gave subprime mortgage debt a triple-A rating and said that it had the same chances of default 
as a U.S. Treasury bond or a Government of Canada bond. You could blame unscrupulous mortgage lenders who approved people who had no business to be approved for mortgages and then quickly flipped them to other financial institutions. You can blame